Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the virtual book launch of Keith McCafferty and his marvelous new book, The Bangtail Ghost. Keith was kind enough to sign copies for us, and I'm happy to say that we have sold them all. But you can still buy an unsigned copy, and I really want to commend the cover to you because I think that the jacket art with the eyes of the mountain lion is spectacular. So is that your design, Keith, or was that a genius in the art department at Viking? Yeah. You know, I was surprised from the start that um, Viking Penguin gave me a great deal of input on the cover design. This was the first one where we didn't go back and forth for the course, course of a month. Uh, they sent me a proposed cover. It's just very much like the one that you see, except that the eyes were sort of white or amber, and I said, well, it should have green eyes, because that's in the book, and that's true to life. So my only contribution is the color of the eyes. <laughs> well, I think the color of the eyes is really important, but I think it's a very dramatic cover. And I do think, I do think Keith, that the lions, the two lions in this book, are, are just such great characters, and I have to tell you that I was rooting for the female lion all the way through. Well, I was too. Of course, I had a little bit, of, a little bit of say what would happen to her. <laughs> yes, um, and I, I think the point you make, um, you know, about what happens to animals as humans keep encroaching on their territory. How do? It's a big problem here in Arizona, all the way from like rattlesnakes to puma and coyotes, which jog around in our streets and so forth. What happens, right. you know, when their natural habitat is? Um, crowded or eroded, and then how do we live with them? Well, you know, and, and each each species is different, but with, with mountain lions, basically what happens is as, the, uh, as their natural habitat is destroyed or encroached upon, the, um, the young cats are pushed to the fringe of the habitat. It's, especially young male lions pushed by bigger toms, older established toms. And so you've got these young male lions in river bottoms and places where people have second homes, vacation homes, or just live. And those young cats see people every day, they see them every day, every day. And their sort of natural fear begins to erode. And at a certain point, some of them start looking at people as perhaps something they could eat, especially small people. And although they very, very, very rarely follow through, they do often enough to show us that we're not always at the top of the food chain. Absolutely true. Um, I was thinking about, you know, the mountain lions are native to Montana, but I was thinking the other day about the, the pythons that have gone amok in Florida, introduced by people into an environment they don't belong to. And those Burmese pythons, they're yep. terrible, terrible. And, and those suckers can actually eat crocodiles, I mean, or no, alligators rather, um, you know, can actually right. devour them. And it, it, the species is so invasive that I think they really almost have an edge over um, other species, where in, in your case here with the cats, it's, it's the reverse. The cats are not the dominant population. They're being <laughs> crowded by people. So Florida is kind of an interesting example of how it can work the other way. When well, you know, there were precedents too, because you know, in South America, a lot of uh, a lot of farmers uh, imported mongooses to control the snake population, and what they found out was like Ricky Ticky Tabby, the famous mongoose, would kill cobras. Well, mongooses can kill cobras because cobras can only strike by rearing up and falling forward. Um, so they don't have a chance against a mongoose, but a rattlesnake just strikes from an S and the mongoose is found out right away, they don't want to mess with a rattlesnake. So they don't eat the snakes that they were brought to uh, kill and instead they just start killing chickens. It's the same story the world over when, you know, when we start introducing species that, you know, don't really belong. Oh, you are so right. And you know what? It's not just fauna. I mean, um... In New Zealand, for example, settlers bought rabbits, and the rabbits, you know, produced havoc. But, but the flora is a real problem. In our last visit to New Zealand, which will be a year and a half ago, 
they've undertaken a huge eradication program of removing all of the foreign flora to allow the native flora to make a big comeback and also provide more of a habitat for native animals as well. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting project because we tend to think of this as just animals, but the truth is it can be plants as well, plants and trees. Sure, the lantana in India, you know, uh, one reason this book was important to me is because I've always been in love with the great cats to the point where I spent weeks in India with tigers for Field and Stream magazine to write about them. And there you have the same kind of thing. The uh, natural plants in the terai are largely disappearing because they're cutting the trees for match, match factories to make matches. But they have another invasive species, uh, which is sort of like kudzu, you know, it's everywhere. It's called lantana. But it's a double-edged sword because as some native species of plants are eradicated, this lantana grows up. And this lantana actually provides cover for apex predators like tigers. So in a few places, this invasive species is not entirely bad. <laughs> it's very, you know, each, each place has, has its own dynamic at work. Oh, you are so right. We actually have lantana flourishes here. It's all over our garden. And um, the, one of the invasive species here is eucalyptus that was brought in from Australia because it was cheap uh -huh. landscaping. Um, and the eucalyptus tree is not an ideal tree in a place where you get lots of monsoons and other things. They're pretty fragile. Anyway, we aren't talking ecology, although I do think no. it's worth pointing out that all of your books um, really embrace nature, the natural world. Um, and, and you do write about Montana as, as a haven for that, as a landscape. That's really important to you, not just the mystery, but to write about um, about where Sean Stranahan lives, where he works. And and also I wanted to I wanted him to work sort of in the in the world I live in here in Montana as the state changes, you know, from an extractive agricultural mining uh, economy to one that's more tourist based. I always say that, you know, the the gears of Montana run on trout slime. Um, so I, did, I wanted him to be in that world, that changing world where a lot of the old ranches get sold off and you know other people come in and take over rather than just the wide open counties, which we have some in uh, Eastern Montana and Wyoming. I think you'll see more of that as there's a big exodus from Silicon Valley and other urban centers. My guess is that Montana will be a place where more and more people will go in order to acquire living space. And and to avoid COVID, at least in the beginning, we had people coming to Montana and buying up condominiums and homes. That was when we had almost no cases. Now they might be a little bit more hesitant. Well, <laughs> it's true all over, but I definitely think that COVID is reshaping um, urbanization and you know causing people to think about how they want to live and if they can work at home and so forth, it also changes things dramatically. So Montana will be, I think, a, a hot spot like Vancouver was, you know, when Hong Kong shut down. And it was astonishing how many people migrated from Hong Kong to Canada, especially Vancouver is an entry point, although now heavily in Toronto. Uh, why did you call this book The Bangtail Ghost? Tell us about that, because it's a great title. Well, I'm searching for a title always, you know. <laughs> well, The Bangtail Mountains, are a small isolated mountain range north of the town where I live. So, uh, and then there's a Bangtail Creek in the Madison Valley, at least that's locally what it's called, and supposedly named after a prostitute. Because in Old English, not Old English, but in England, a Bangtail was another name for a prostitute. And yet a third meaning of Bangtail is a horse if a horse's tail is cut straight across like lop straight across the back that's often called a bang tail so i i like place names and uh here was bang tail sort of you know i look i look out my window and i can see the crazy mountains and right across the river there's the bang tail mountains 
So I think that's why why I did it. Well, the reason I asked is when you started out like the Royal Wolf Murders, you were naming um, books after flies that you tied, that's right? right? Fishing flies. So the bangtail ghost was a bit of a departure. I was trying to figure out a bangtail. It fly. is, but I have a bangtail ghost fly, yep. like the one I sent you. So I always have the fly, but um, sometimes it's a fly that I've made up, you know. And <laughs> Uh, I think the, the, in uh, A Death in Eden, it's, called, it's a fly called The Usual Suspect. So there's no fly called A Death in Eden. So, yeah, I'm playing a little bit loose, I guess. And also, um, you know, Viking decided they were going to change the appearance a little bit and wouldn't have a fly on the inside cover. So, uh, so I didn't have to worry about getting, getting that right. I love my bangtail fly that you tied for me. He has this gorgeous black feathery plumage, but then he's got this wonderful kind of mauve streak. He's he's really well, handsome. So that's I, I will claim you know the development for that fly, and I've used it to catch maybe two or three dozen steelhead over the years. Great big seafaring rainbow trout. So it's an actual working fly. Yeah. Whereas when I made up a fly for an earlier book, Dead Man's Fancy. There's really, you know, I just made that up, you know, that was my fancy. <laughs> well, I mean, you're an author, so you're allowed to make stuff. I'm books. allowed to. Well, I had to make a decision right away whether this was going to be a book, whether these, this was going to be a series of books that had a lot of fishing in them and flies, and I didn't want to be constrained like that. And the truth is, neither did, uh, neither did Catherine at Penguin Books. Uh, so I... I'm sort of tied to fishing and tied to tying flies, but um, I have to walk a fine line, you know. I, I have to appeal to the people who fish or who know people who fish, but then also keep in mind that the majority of the people who read my books have no interest whatsoever in that. Well, I think, I think Sean, when we first met him, he was clearly doing a lot of fishing. Um, and if I recall, wasn't he doing, isn't he a watercolor artist or something similar? That's right. And that, that was because my son Tom is a watercolor and now an oil artist, and I thought, well, if I make him an artist, I can use my son, you know, as a sounding board. And, <laughs> well, in and also because in Montana, a lot of people have two or three jobs just to get by, so I wanted Sean to have two or three jobs and be sort of realistic that way. Well, I also think it works well if you're going to have a guy who's going to go off and investigate crimes and initially, unofficially, um, if he's tied down to like a desk job or something, then how does he do that? But the way you structured his life where, you know, he was, he had several different jobs or things he could be doing. He had, he had the free time to do his first investigation, but now he's become more, more part of the law enforcement community, right? You've evolved him. Yes, I've evolved him, and and I hope Martha Ettinger, the sheriff, and uh, so that's another thing I wanted to do in this book was to explore or go further with their relationship, because people readers kept saying you've got to do something with them, you know, they got to move. <laughs> Something's got to happen soon, you know. <laughs> Well, when you started out, Martha and Sean were really at odds. They didn't look as though they were going to be a potentially um, romantic couple. So I think... Well, I didn't know that either. <laughs> well, there you are. Right. Um, and in fact, Sean's best relationship when we started out was in part with the, with the club. Tell us about the fishing club, because they were his big support group. Well, I'll put on my hat. Excellent. Look at the Madison River Liars and Fly Tires hat. Yep. <laughs> That's my fishing group, with a heavy emphasis on the lying, because the uh, charter members of our our little group, the Madison River Flyers and Fly Tires, I'm the only one that ties flies. But it's essentially it's four people, four four, four of my friends. Well, I'm one, so three friends. We have been getting together to fish and camp every year for about 35 years. And we've missed very, very few occasions. This is the first occasion where we've all sort of missed it for obvious reasons. But um, I, I, want, I don't know how I came up, to tell you the truth, Barbara. <laughs> I'm not sure how I came up with that. And 
And I think you told me that, that the head character, Patrick Willoughby, is nice to have a character who can, who can fund Sean and, and have him move around the globe easier. And I've never forgotten you telling me that. And, I, and of course, I've used that quite a bit. Well, but it is well, important because not only does Sean, if he's if you're not a part of formal law enforcement, then yeah. you you need two things. You need um, time in order to work a case, and you absolutely need funding. And you know, some of the early detectives I always think about this were like rabbis and priests and so forth because you know they they had um, Rabbi Winter, for example, was a wonderful mm -hmm. series character. Father Brown from Chesterton. Um, I mean, they had, um, you know, a structure, they had a salary, they had free time, and they could therefore look into right. things in a, in a semi-official or private, even a private capacity that um, the average person couldn't. I, it, that's also the reason, I think, for, for sleuths like Lord Peter Whimsey or Albert Campion, you know, um, mm -hmm. in England, because they, they had private incomes. They didn't actually work. Well, you know, um, I've always wanted to have have a book in which Martha is the major character. Right. And I sort of stepped out of line a little bit a couple of books ago with uh, A Death in Eden, and I had Harold become more of a major character. Every book, I sit down and I say, okay, this will be Martha's book. But she, as long as she's elected sheriff, mm -hmm. is tied down a little ways. You know, she's not free and easy. And so... Uh, this next time out, I'm going to make her a little bit, uh, have have her have the time to become more involved, hopefully. Well, that's an interesting idea, but Martha has an additional problem, which is as sheriff, she has to really obey the strictures of the law, that's whereas right. Sean um, and anybody working with him um, doesn't have the same the same legal responsibilities or in some cases perhaps even the same ethical responsibilities and I mean that's part of the appeal isn't it of somebody like Sean somebody like a private investigator they're almost like you know not, not a hired gunslinger ne necessarily but their loyalty really goes to a, a client or a person who hires them not that's to right. the law enforcement community right Right, like they say, they join hands with the dead, and um, and Sean is a little bit free to explore that, and and Martha is a little bit harder to get her involved right now. But I, but I, but I certainly will in this next book if I get to write another book. <laughs> Well, I certainly hope so, because there are all kinds of good things yeah. happening here. Yeah. So, so generally in your books, there's some kind of spectacular death that starts out. You've had some really horrendous scenarios. In the beginning, you know, most of those deaths were things that I knew about in real life. And uh, in Crazy Mountain Kiss, I think, I that opening chapter where the people shoot each other's, couple shoot each other's horses and die in a snowstorm, well, that's based on a real incident that I reported on when I was uh, a journalist. And uh, so a, a, lo a lot of these things are based on my own experience. And in The Bangtail Ghost, the very first chapter is quite literally uh, an experience I had bumping into two uh, lions in the middle of the night. Wow. All, the only thing I changed in the book is I only had to be one lion. But that's really the first chapter of the book is my own experience, almost verbatim. I was very interested in the female lion's injury. I did not realize that a uh, mountain lion could be disabled by something like porcupine quills, but she's really suffering because her, I think it's her right paw is, um, has been invaded by quills and hugely painful and it's kind of withered and so she's not really able to hunt the way she used to. It's a, it's a very, actually it's a very common, um, a very common problem. Uh, and it was why in India, a, a lot of the tigers in the northern part of the uh, country turned to man-eating was because they had uh, quills from porcupines. And the quills 
the cats try to break them off, but they're very, they're, they, they, they won't break. All they really do is shovel them in farther. And then once they're in, they can travel. They can travel all the way to an animal's heart, you know, and, and kill it. Um, so it's, a, it's the, the mothers will teach the cubs how to attack porcupines, flipping them on their back. But occasionally they do get, they do get a mouthful or an armful of porcupine quills and they never dissolve. And so they're a constant source of pain, and um, and they compromise the you know the speed of the cat. So they they really you know they really uh, it's, it's very very serious matter. And the only way you can get take them out really is to tranquilize the cat <clears throat> and pull them out. I was not aware that porcupines were such a food source for cats. Um, I didn't even know there were porcupines in India. You just revealed something to me. That, huge. Uh, They're much bigger than ours. Yeah? Yeah. But, you know, here we have the um, uh, and a weasel called the pine marten. And, um, and its larger cousins. And they have a, more or less a cyclical relationship with the porcupines where uh, they specialize on eating porcupines. That's called, it's actually the subspe the species is the fisher. It's called a fisher. And it's like a, it's like a, a big weasel. And they eat porcupines, that's their preferred food. And as they eat porcupines, the porcupines disappear and the fishers produce fewer, uh, in, fewer in the litter. And then as they produce fewer in the litter, the porcupine populations rebound and it's a cycle, and it goes on and on and on, like uh, bobcats and uh, and and uh, jackrabbits down where you live. So in the Bang Tail Ghost, we've talked about the cats and so forth, but um, who is it that is um, who is it that dies, and it makes the cat like the primo suspect? Well, I have several people who who die in it. Um, well, I was talking about yeah. the first one. Oh, um, I don't have the book in front of me, so I'm not sure. <laughs> so, Is it book there? I think so. And then, and then we get the woman who's living in the. Oh yeah, Clarice. She's right. the first person who dies. I think so. Right. Right. I, and and I think it's fascinating. I was not aware that um, that there were. There were women, I mean, I knew about women who worked at truck stops, you know, to have sex, That's right. have sex yeah. with truckers, and that was kind of a thing. Um, but I wasn't aware that um, I, that women could, like, camp out or, or have a trailer or whatever they might do in hunting areas so that hunters out for a big weekend could behave like truckers at a truck stop. <laughs> Well, I don't know how, how widespread it is. I first became aware of that when I lived in Michigan. And there were uh, deer camp madams, we called them. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of the guys strayed while they were supposed to be <laughs> hunting deer. So I did hear about it happening in Montana. Uh, I heard somebody called the elk, cap, the elk camp madam. And I started putting her in books, and this is the first time I really ex explored her, actually, and bring her in as a character, who gives Sean a clue that helps move along the plot. Well, I think it's interesting because, you know, a question, I mean, there, there's sort of an implication that, you know, a person like her, maybe her death was not as significant if she'd been a more upright citizen or something. Right. Um, I think, you know, she was, I think, like I said, talking about slaves, you know, and for the census, they were only like three fifths of a human being counted. And I sort of felt that way about uh, a prostitute. And I wanted her to be a sympathetic character. Uh, and this, and also, I wanted her to be related to Sam, my uh, fishing guide character in the book. Uh, and and I wanted, you know, I had to have a, a vehicle to get Sean and basically Martha on the trail, and her footsteps are really the opening of the book. You know, following her footsteps to her demise. Yes. 
um, which may or may not have been the cat and which introduces all sorts of things. But, you know, Keith, it's an interesting thing about victims. You know, you want, you want people to be sympathetic with them and you want their deaths to matter, but they also, right. unless, you know, it's a completely random thing, very often victims put themselves in harm's way so that, you know, they do end up murdered mm -hmm. or whatever happens to them. So I think that's a, you know, it's a fine line that you have to walk as a, as a crime novelist about how to make your victim both um, worthy of being a victim and yet a sympathetic character. Yeah, and I have another victim in it who is a Peruvian sheep herder, and that also is taken from, from life here in Montana. We have quite a few Peruvian uh, sheep herders uh, tending sheep up in the big uh, public ranges, and they live, they, they work around the clock, and they live on, uh, have three-year visas, and they stay with the uh, sheep nine months of the year, just all by themselves, isolated. I have to say that I really minded his death, kiddo, because, I mean, he was just unlucky. Um, right. And sometimes, yes, you right. know, sometimes that happens, then, you know, it's just wrong place, wrong time kind of thing. But I liked your sheep herder. I've spent a lot of time in Peru. I've actually watched sheep herders herding sheep in Peru. Um, uh -huh. And I could see him. I could see why um, the job worked for him, that, you know, it was a way for him to make money to support his family. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm always sad when there's like a bystander that winds up being killed instead of somebody that kind of courts danger. It's a very different thing, isn't it? And as a novelist, you have certain people that are, it's very hard to kill them off if you have a serious character like I do. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Those people tell me, I can, you know, they may allow me to kill off a, a minor character or maybe even a major character, but they're not going to let me kill a dog. No, I, I observed that it was the mountain lion and not the sheepdog. You know, that was it at risk here. By the way, that's a very nice cat that seems to be asleep over there behind you. Is that a well-behaved kitty? That is that is my new cat, my new writing cat, Scarlet. Um, she has five toes on all four feet, so she has mountain lion paws. Six toes. I'm sorry, Barbara. Right, six toes. My wife makes it. So she's like Hemingway's cats that he had in Cuba, you know, all those six-toed cats. Is it a special were... breed? No. No, six-toes six um, is just a genetic abnormality. It's actually common. Uh, a lot of cats have all four feet with six toes, like my little Scarlet, and some only have maybe two feet with six toes. It used to be considered luck by ship captains, like ship merchant captains. And they would always have a six-toed cat on board. They thought that they were better at catching rats and mice, and that they were more stable on, in a tossing sea. Whether or not they were, they were considered to be good luck, and that's why we have a lot of places where ship captains have dropped off cats. Now in Europe, where some of those ships may have started, it's a different story. There they believed that six-toed cats were uh, you know, evil, <laughs> should be burned at the stake, and so six-toed cats were killed. You know, but the, I've... Um, <laughs> one of the reasons I love talking to you is I absolutely never know where we're going to wind up down some rabbit <laughs> hole or other, um, but I always learn fascinating things from you, so this is my first experience with a six-toed cat. Six well, I'll, sh I'll show you, Barbara. All right. Oh, she's going to be okay being picked up, huh? There's those big feet. Oh my goodness, they really are. Patrick, hustle over here. Patrick's a cat lover. Look at these, <laughs> uh, these yeah. six-toed, big pod. Yeah, they, there's a word for that, something. See that big thing? Yeah. Let me, let me take a picture of, of that, Keith. Hold up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cute. Got she's it. not too excited there right now. There she is, but... talking on cue. Right, there she's lovely. Wow. She's and she she's licked her lips. Yep, no, she's good, right? We have a dog that okay. behaves very largely like your cat, so it's always good to see her. 
Yeah. I got some good pictures. Good. Yeah. I'm delighted. Do you have any questions you want to? Yeah, there are a couple of questions. Patrick's wandered over here with a couple of questions. Let's do that. Sure. So we'll Patrick. Wander back. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Uh, John, John, it says, uh, love the books, Keith. You've toyed with some action, you, excuse me. You've toyed with some action taking place in Florida. Is that something yeah. we might see someday? Well, I have Sam having part of his guiding business out of Florida. The truth is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, trout fishing guides in Montana who spend the winter months um, guiding out of uh, the Florida Keys and other places in, in the Caribbean. So it's, it's very natural for someone like Sam, who's a trout guide in Montana, to, to try to have a two or three month long business in the Bahamas or in, or in Key West. And I lived in the Florida Keys uh, for a year, and then one of my best friends lived in Key West, and I would visit him every year, so I'm very familiar with the area. And, you know, in this case, you sort of write about what you know. Uh, and I like to I like to get sh have an excuse to get Sean out of Montana once in a while, while understanding that Montana is very much a character in the book. Uh, for me, as a writer, it's refreshing to move him around, and give him an excuse to go somewhere, uh, or maybe to bring out some other aspect. Well, of this his personality. this partly explains Hemingway's presence, you know, with your familiarity with the keys, right? Yeah, it's a very strange thing. Yeah, uh, I'm actually supposed to have gone to uh, Northern Michigan just a couple of weeks ago to follow in Hemingway's footsteps and, and write about it because he lived in Michigan for the first 20 years of his life or most of the time in Michigan. So by some strange coincidence uh, is, you know, I happened to have gone to Cuba to write and gone to Hemingway's home there. I lived in the Florida Keys where he had a home I grew up in Michigan, largely, uh, where he grew up. And I'm now in the Rocky Mountain West where where he ended up. And very, you know, who knows, you know, I don't know why. I certainly, it was never a conscious thing to, to go to those places. And in fact, I didn't even know I, I was going on a fishing trip to Sun Valley in Idaho. And I saw a young couple standing in the rain by a gravestone, a great big gravestone that was lying down, and a little light bulb went off in my head, and I said, I'll bet that's Ernest Hemingway. So I got out in the rain, and sure enough, it was. And at that point, I didn't even know that he had lived there. <laughs> I mean, I'd heard, but I, I didn't know much about it. Now I, now I know a bit about it. Wow, well, he's a wonderful character, too. I think he would have been a hard character to live with, but he's a fascinating character to write about. Well, Yes, I think, and I think he was also, I mean, um, he was a very hard person to put your finger on. He was much more than just a male chauvinist, whatever. Um, and, you know, we're, we're very good friends with Valerie Hemingway, who lives about four blocks down the road, and she's opened a lot of doors for me, Hemingway-wise. She was married to Gregory, Ernest Hemingway's youngest son, and... She was Ernest Hemingway's traveling companion, uh, you know, compadre and uh, personal secretary for the last two years of his life, basically. Patrick, do you have a question? Well, it's funny you mentioned those three places, Michigan, Key, the Florida Keys, and uh, Montana. Jim Harrison also went to those three places, and Tom McGuane, and there's a kind of a group that hung out in those well, areas. Uh, you're right, you're right, you're right. Uh, Tom, I know Tom a little bit. He, he lives he lives near here, and Jim Harrison lived here part of the time. He also lived down on the down around you, sort of down on the southern Arizona right. border, I think. Patagonia. Yeah. <laughs> My son, because of me, he got he got an internship at Field and Stream magazine, and this was during Jim Harrison's like his last few years of his life. And Jim Harrison would write for Field and Stream magazine. He didn't want to have anybody touch his prose, you know. But he'd turn in a 16,000-word story that they had to cut to 3,000 words. <laughs> Everybody was afraid of Jim Harrison, which if you've ever met him, you can understand why, because he's got this deep, gravelly voice. And he's a very scary person. And uh, so they would say, Tom, you know, my son, 21 years older, Tom, 
you talk to Jim Harrison, you tell him we have to cut this. <laughs> so there was my son, you know, the youngest person on the staff there, and he's supposed to be Jim Harrison's editor at <laughs> Field and Street. I'm probably chopping him up. <laughs> well, you got it. You got a long gray with him, and Jim Harrison kept saying, "Well, you got to come. You know, you got to come uh, to my house, and I'll cook for you, and all this." Because my son was cook, a cook too. But he died. You know, it never came to pass. He died with a pencil in his hand, writing a poem. That's what. That's what uh, Tom McGuane said. Jim Harrison, not your son. Yeah, Jim Harrison. Yeah, my son's my son's still still in good shape here. Good. Although you know he's quarantined in Seattle. Not quarantine, but you know, right. like we all have. All right, I have a question from uh, Bruce, who asks: When you get your movie deal with Netflix, who do you envision? <laughs> who do you envision playing Sean and Martha? <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, Surely you've been asked this before. It's a the actress who was in Fr Friday Night Lights. What's her name? Um, played the coach's wife. I can't recall her name. I've always envisioned her when I when I write Martha's character, uh, and Sean is always I've always envisioned people who were not actors really. Uh, I think of him though I do a, you know my books are read are narrated by Rick Holmes who's who's a, a great really nice man who does a lot of Broadway and movies and television, but he doesn't look anything at all like Sean. <laughs> Uh, so you know, I'm afraid I, I'm afraid I don't really have a, a a TV actor in mind. Of course, I haven't had an offer yet, but supposedly, oh yeah, Co Connie Britton, right? I had her in mind. See, when I came up with her character, I was the second ch chapter of the Royal Wolf Murders. I knew I needed a sheriff. I didn't know whether it would even be a woman, let alone Martha. And I just sat there and doodled around, and I came up with Martha, and I came up with her name. So I, well, I took her name from the girl I grew up with, who was my best friend, Karen Enninger, instead of Edinger. So I took her name, and then Martha was modeled after a pig farmer named Gwen, who I knew who had a pig farm on the bank of the Yellowstone River. She was also a cowboy poet. So those were her beginnings. Uh, but you know, soon they, you know, they um, sort of have a life of their own. Yeah. Right. They're themselves and nobody else. I have uh, one last question here from John, who asks: uh, You mentioned <laughs> lots of vehicles by name in the series, but Etta, but Etta does a commercial for a fictitious truck brand. Was there any legal, right. any legal reason why you chose to do that? Well, what did I have to be an, an abs absorki or absaruka? Um, which is which is a made-up truck brand, right? It's was it supposed to be a Chevy Chevy Absaroka, I think. Um, I just like the name. It's one of those names that has two or three pronunciations. Some people say the proper pronunciation is Absorki, or is it Absaroka, or is it Absaruka? And we decided for or Rick Holmes and I decided for for purposes of the narration it would be. Uh, Absaroka. The funny thing is, is I I wrote that whole little script of her uh, with her truck, and then about a year later, but before the book came out, there was an ad on TV that sort of was sort of reminiscent of what I'd written. And they steal it from me now is just the same, you know. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, there may be a move towards more Montana. Um, um, video of, of um, crime novels because uh, C.J. Box's series uh, with Cassie Duell is going to be is called Big Sky and it's going to start airing I think in October on ABC yeah. and it is it is indeed as you can tell from Big Sky you know going to be set in Montana although Cassie was um, in the Dakotas and so forth in the books but it has ended up in Montana. So, you know. She's just in sort of in northeastern Montana up there. Yeah. Uh, but my point is that, you know, there's always an appetite if, you know, if a place becomes really popular in one mm -hmm. series, then there's an appetite for more. So.
So right. we could just be blazing a trail for you and Sean, you know, to. Hopefully. Yeah, well, <laughs> why not? I mean, Montana is incredibly, you know, scenic and beautiful. Um, and it's a short, short shooting season. That's why one reason Craig Johnson didn't have the Longmire was not shot in Wyoming is because they had the gears better in place in New Mexico and they had more good weather to work with. <laughs> more good weather and also some good funding. New Mexico has been aggressive about, you know, supporting video. I mean, Vancouver is another place where they have these huge sound stages they built to encourage um, videoing um, up there. So. You know, but COVID's shaking everything up, so who knows how it will all... Well, I heard that that show about uh, the ranch that Kevin Costner is involved with, I, Yellowstone, I thought, um, I think they're going to film their next ep next set of episodes in western Montana somewhere. At least that's what I was told. I don't know. I'm not familiar with that one, but I'm all for serial television for novels because I think... I think, you know, it's a different platform. You get to experience them in a different way, but it's also wonderful for authors because it brings you more readers, which means sure. you can go on writing right. your books, which I'm always in favor of. Yeah. So speaking of writing your books, why don't we end by your telling us what you're working on? Well, I'm working on two things. I'm working on another um, a book in the series. Uh, and not too far into it. But I do have an idea, and ha an idea also how to have Martha much more involved in that. And then I'm more than three quarters of the way through a book about uh, growing up in Appalachia, where I did. And uh, I always wanted to write a book with um, young people like I was once there. And cause, because the country hasn't changed much, the problems are the same, except. Uh, yeah, you know, now it's methamphetamine and not moonshine, but uh, it's the same poverty, and that's where I grew up, and uh, that's the last thing I ever did with my mother before she died, as I read aloud to her the, you know, the two-thirds or so of the book that I had written, and she said, oh, you know, you should finish that, and uh, I've let it sit now for 10 years, but I think it's, I sort of used this COVID semi-break to, uh, to try to work on it. So I'm getting very close to the end of that. Are you pleased with it? Yeah, because it's, it's sort of more of a labor of love in a sense. It's, you know, it's, it's my own life growing up that of course transformed somewhat. Um, I don't know if it has commercial potential, but I decided that I, my wife said, well, you don't, you know, write the book that you would regret if you didn't write. And that's the one where I would regret if I didn't write it. So I'm far enough through it now that I know I can finish it. And I don't know what will, will happen from there, you know. Um, we'll see, but I gotta do it. It, it means a lot to me. Uh, and that's based more on mining. You know, uh, I grew up with strip mining and uh, now there's two mountaintop removal sites within five miles of where I grew up and uh, so I wanted to have that as a backdrop issue, as it was for me. It does sound like writing the book of your heart would be an excellent thing to do in a and, time of And stress. saving wildlife from those areas, you know. Yeah. I used to catch snakes by the hundreds to transplant them to streams that weren't um, being killed, killed off by pollution. <laughs> well, you've had a really interesting life. Um, and I, <laughs> I do think you've been fortunate to travel as much as you have, you know, working for Field and Stream has sent you to some amazing places with great experiences and it's it's grand that you can now write about them, you know, in book form rather than in article form and share those with us. I used to say it was like flying around the world on a broom, writing for Field and Stream, except the fly rod was my broom. <laughs> And they'd send me here and there fish, you know. So, well, that sounds like a good job. <laughs> and it was a good job for a lot of years. Well, times change, but how wonderful that you got to indulge in something that you loved while also supporting yourself and your family. Keith, you've been really fortunate. Oh, no, I'm very, very much aware of that. Uh, sometimes I get, you know, it's, it's 
it's, it's really tough writing novels for me. You know, it's, it's the hardest work I've ever done. And uh, every book I say, I don't know if I can do that again. I don't know if I can do that again. <laughs> and I remember Nevada Bar telling me, oh, that 13th book just killed me. <laughs> that was fun, wasn't it? When we had you and Nevada here together. Oh, she's a character. She's yeah. a character. And I saw, I saw her again at, a, at one of the Bowser cons. And, uh, um, well, she, she, she had dinner with, uh, with us because uh, Dominic... Uh, Abel was her literary agent, who's who's mine. So, uh, so our paths crossed. You know. That's very. Yeah, she's a character. She's a character. I don't. And I haven't talked to her now for. She she sent me an email. It's been maybe seven or eight months ago, or maybe it was less than that. But. Well, so it's yeah. good to check in. Well, I will yeah. end by thanking you for adding the bangtail ghost to my beautiful collection of flies that you have tied for me. I really treasure them. Well, I hope that there will be more. You know, you're only there's only three people that have a full set. You know. <laughs> yes. Okay. Catherine and you and Dominic. Wow. And Catherine, I don't even know how to send something to right now, but I will. Well, I do treasure them, and I didn't transport it down here because I didn't want anything terrible to no. happen to it, but. I'll take a photo of them and post it on Instagram. So thank you, Keith, very much. It's always well, a pleasure. Thank you, and, and I hope you you know you guys weather this well and stay safe. And um, I really appreciate you doing this and doing everything for me over these past ten years. Um, so far, the only Bangtail Ghost books I've seen have been the ones I sent to you. <laughs> well, it's really been our pleasure. I've read you from the beginning, collect you myself, and truly admired right. that your work. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, I hope that you will buy a copy of The Bangtail Ghost, if not from us, from somebody, and enjoy it. And enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you very much, Barbara.